Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, and welcome back to the third uh, um, edition of the GOSH teaching program. And this time we do not have a neurosurgeon. We have an um, ENT surgeon, uh, Mr. Rob Nash. Uh, so Robert uh, is a colleague uh, um, uh, of mine and he works at Great Ormond Street. He did his medical um, degree in Oxford and then uh, the training and the fellowship uh, um, in London. And he really, uh, as me, he loves uh, here and uh, he specializes in uh, cochlear implant. So uh, I learned a lot uh, from him during these years and uh, I'm really looking forward this, um, to this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, Rob, um, welcome. Thank you very much for doing that. I will be collecting the, the question uh, and now the stage is yours. Super, thank you very much, Felicia. I never, I never knew you knew me so well. Um, uh, so my homework. <laughs> so um, I'm talking today about otoscopy for paediatric radiologists, which actually it's quite a niche talk to um, ask to be uh, talk to, to talk about. But um, um, I'll, 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 I'll see how relevant I can make it for you. So the aim is obviously to teach you all how to perform otoscopy on children. So if you all get out the otoscopes that you um, have, have had since medical school, then we can talk through it step by step. Now, ob obviously that's, that's ridiculous. Obviously, I'm not here to teach you about uh, uh, performing otoscopy. I'm here to show you what otoscopy can show in an ear so that you can understand what it can't show and thus what we request imaging to find out. And then we're talking about that particularly in the context of the most common ear pathologies. So uh, this is a this is what a kind of standard view of a tympanic membrane is, and this is with an otoendoscope. So looking inside the ear canal, you've got a lovely view of the ear canal on your way in, and then you've got a, a nice uh, clear view of the whole part of the eardrum here, the past uh, faster at the top and the past tense of this kind of bluey gray uh, uh, disc, uh, which is just a little bit uh, uh, transparent to the extent that you can see some of the structures deep to it. Uh, sometimes you see the ossicles uh, in this ear because of the angulation you can see the anterior part of the middle ear a bit more clearly and you can just see a bit of a curve there which is probably the anterior part of the uh, cochlea, maybe the uh, carotid artery, something along those lines, uh, the eustachian tube orifice. You get a bit of a clue about what's behind the ear. So when we think about imaging you can see the ear canal we can see the eardrum, we can see a little bit of what's deep to the eardrum, but we can't really see what's going on within the mastoid. We can't see very much about what's happening around the cochlea itself. That's just a little bit too deep. And we can't see anything that's going on around the labyrinth. So that's really what we can't see uh, in patients who have, you know, most ear pathologies or most, or when you can see the eardrum. Um, but that's actually not really too much of a problem because actually the vast majority of ear complaints happen at the eardrum. Essentially, they're a problem of the eardrum. So cholesteatoma, perforation, retraction, all the most common manifestations of chronic otitis media are a problem at the eardrum. And most of the problems which aren't a problem of the eardrum itself can be actually quite readily detected through tympanograms and hearing tests. So people who have a normal, uh, you know, adults who have a normal eardrum uh, and a conductive hearing loss are most likely to have otosclerosis. And children with an intact eardrum, which may or may not show some inflammation, uh, who have a conductive hearing loss and a flat tympanogram are very likely to have glue ear. And that really enables us to assess really quite a lot of work, work, uh, about what's going on. There are some limitations. So this is a patient you can see in the ear canal, there's a little bit of fluid, a little bit of squamous debris. And it's only really when you pull out with the endoscope that you can see just in the past placida here, a collection of uh, keratin, i.e. cholesteatoma. And the reason for that is 
the angulation as you look inside the ear canal just means that your view of the posterior superior aspect of the pars plaster is not always brilliant. But you do see patients who are treated for things like polyps and so on who have cholesteatoma that isn't identified sometimes even after they have an EUA, although that is uncommon. What happens, what's a, may, what's a big problem is quite a lot of patients who we see with an, uh, who have chronic ear infections and we're wondering about cholesterol and so on have findings like this. So you look inside their ear canal and they're staring at you, stopping your view of the ear canal is a large polyp or granulation or something like that, making it very, very difficult to see what is medial to that and having a very a limited idea of what's going on in the eardrum. And it's patients like this who we really need um, uh, imaging to help us with the diagnosis. If patients like this, for patients like this, otoscopy still tells us a lot. They tell us that they have a significant ear problem. They, it gives us a lot of information about the infection, but it doesn't tell us the etiology of that infection. So what are the most common pathologies of the middle ear? Well, uh, obviously, or, or middle and external ear, uh, chronic otitis media in all its uh, manifestations, whether or not you include glue ear or otitis media with effusion with that, but uh, its manifestation of perforation, retraction, cholesteatoma, the effect that those conditions can have on the ossicle, so ossicular discontinuity, which can obviously be acquired or can be congenital, uh, and tympanosclerosis, which can also cause conductive hearing loss in the absence of external manifestations of infection. A range of ear canal pathologies, uh, from narrow ear canals to excessively wide ear canals, like cholesteatoma and lesions within it, and then conditions really of the inner ear, which manifest in the middle ear in terms of their uh, presentation, um, otosclerosis, and then the window syndromes like superior canal dehiscence, in which imaging is obviously crucial. But really, when we kind of consider all of those conditions, they really just come down to manifesting themselves principally in two ways, either with recurrent infections or with reduced hearing. And the aim of our treatment largely is treating infections and treating reduced hearing. And the only other thing which we consider beyond that really is, oh, have we left a condition which is going to you know, affect the facial nerve or affect the balance function or something like that. Um, but really those instances are really quite uncommon when we're assessing an ear, mainly we're thinking of infection and hearing loss. So uh, let's go through some cases and uh, think about uh, uh, our findings on, on otoscopy and uh, what is relevant from an imaging perspective then for these patients with the otoscopic findings that we have. And we have to think about the certainty of our diagnosis. What is causing the problem? We want to look for a concomitant pathology by which I mean complications. So for example, if you are certain that a patient has cholesterol, you probably still want to do a scan to see if there is a secular erosion or an inner ear fistula or erosion of the tegmen or something like that. Uh, thirdly, uh, the importance of imaging for planning surgery. Once again, uh, with cholesterol, we often think about front to back surgery or back to front surgery, depending on the size and uh, morphology of the mastoid. And then lastly, the likelihood of concurrent pathology. And really, this is actually kind of a rare thing for ear problems, but uh, it's relevant for some people with uh, syndromic diagnoses, for example, or patients with glomus tumors and so on who have something wrong in the ear and we're doing imaging to look for a known association to that problem. So uh, uh, as examples, this is a, 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 an issue of certainty of diagnosis. This patient has uh, a, a red eardrum, they have a swelling of the eardrum, uh, but the uh, pattern is very atypical for glue ear and you can see that they've got a lot of soft tissue swelling just lateral to the mastoid so this patient has a CT and MRI to uh, evaluate this and this is what oh, sorry I'll go back Oh, I'm sorry, that video is not working. I apologise for that. Um, and at any rate, this is what the, the, uh, uh, this uh, is found in this case. This soft tissue swelling is not pus, it's not glue. This is uh, Langhan cell histiocytosis, which is obviously uh, much more readily diagnosed on imaging than with otoscopic findings. 
uh, complications. Uh, this is a good example of complications. You can see uh, this patient has uh, cholesteatoma. They have, uh, uh, at their second look surgery, they have uh, there's been a uh, defect into the vestibule identified. And so before uh, uh, surgery, we want to do imaging to have a good idea about that. Uh, really, an inner ear fistula is the most important finding uh, for cholesteatoma surgery. It really does change the nature of surgery quite considerably. Uh, whilst it is true that imaging can't exclude it, frequently in primary surgery, imaging may be some months before uh, a surgery is performed. And uh, knowing that it's there really does change the way you do this. And in this patient, you can see also the uh, uh, the uh, dura is very low laterally, which is going to impede access to the uh, inner ear. And so surgery for this patient Oh, once again, the video is not working. I'm sorry. Surgery for this patient uh, involves removing a lot of the tegmen. So what you can see on the left there is the dura of the middle fossa. Uh, you can see on the right the ear canal. And by removing the tegmen and uh, uh, elevating the dura, the view into the inner ear is uh, significantly improved. Uh, so uh, the last uh, uh, or the third aspect is for planning surgery. And this is uh, a particular example where it might be important to have preoperative imaging before planning surgery. Uh, this is a patient whose uh, cholesterol is going over the top of their superior semicircular canal. And you can see it's extending towards the petrous apex. Obviously, this is going to radically change your surgical plan. And then concurrent pathology, that's a, a glomus tumour in which you might uh, going to want to do imaging of the abdomen and so on and consider uh, serum catecholamines and so on. So uh, we're going to go through some cases and uh, consider those four things on, uh, 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 consider uh, why we might want to perform imaging to look at those four items. So uh, this patient, uh, this is a, a view of a clear tympanic membrane perforation. Uh, the diagnosis is clear. There's really no doubt about it. There's no suspicion of retraction around the edge. You can see the edge of that perforation very clearly. Uh, depending on the hearing test, you may be happy with the ossicles. If the hearing test showed an unusually large conductive hearing loss, then you may think that that plaque of moringosclerosis on the right-hand side of the eardrum, the back of the eardrum, might be associated with some fixation or discontinuity of the ossicles. But if the patient had, for example, a 20 decibel airbone gap, then we would think that that would be in keeping with that perforation and uh, no imaging would be required because we've got a certain diagnosis. We don't think there's likely to be any concomitant diagnosis. We don't think there's likely to be any concomitant pathology or complication. And we don't require imaging to plan surgery. We can perform this just down the ear canal. This case, on the other hand, is rather different. So this is uh, a tympanic membrane, which the past tensor all looks intact, but the past flaster has got a, a, a plug of wax within it. Now, we can try and remove that wax as uh, thoroughly as possible to see what's behind it, but really the diagnosis here isn't clear. Wax isn't formed in the medial two thirds of the ear canal. Wax has to be pushed there, and it's possible that this wax was pushed down there. However, equally, it's possible that that's just some dead squamous tissue and beneath it is a cholesterol arising from a classic location. So if you weren't able to remove that uh, wax plug, you'd have a very low threshold to request imaging, likely in the form of CT, to see if there's been significant bony erosion that would uh, indicate cholesterol. You might have an ear that looks like this. So this child has got obviously just awful infection in the ear, there's polyp there, you're not going to be able to see anything at all. So you can try and remove the polyp, that's probably going to lead to some bleeding. You can treat it topically with uh, steroid drops and antibiotic drops and hope that it goes away. But if it doesn't go away, to find out what's going on with this ear, you're going to have to arrange some imaging just because the diagnosis is not clear. With an ear like this, 
you can't see the eardrum at all. That is not the eardrum. That is far too lateral and it doesn't have the kind of uh, uh, characteristic findings that you see with the eardrum in terms of angulation and the quality of the skin overlying it. That is an inflammatory stenosis of the lateral part of the ear canal. You can see it doesn't necessarily involve the medial part of the ear canal because you can see obviously there's a puncture there and beneath the puncture there's at least some aeration. So it's narrower laterally than it is immediately medial to it. But this is a condition which is often associated with stenosis arising from the medial part. And whilst the diagnosis is clear, you want to see how much is there you want to see whether it is affecting the middle ear at all, and you're going to want it to plan surgery. If this is just a lateral stenosis, the surgery is going to be much more limited than if it's actually a plug of uh, fibrous tissue extending down towards the tympanic membrane. When you look in the ear canal with a, uh, an inflammatory stenosis, this would be a more typical picture. See a very narrow ear canal. It's not clear whether the end of it finishes in an eardrum or not. But you can see that the skin itself looks relatively unhealthy. There's some grain of debris, uh, erythema, particularly in the medial part. Once again, an inflammatory stenosis. Once again, the diagnosis is clear. But to plan surgery and identify complications, then you're going to need to request imaging. This is not an inflammatory stenosis, but uh, the proverbial surface ear. So this is what uh, um, exostoses of the ear canal look like. You can see that they drastically reduce your access to the tympanic membrane. We don't know whether or not there's anything going on with the tympanic membrane based purely on otoscopy, uh, but we can see that the patient has exostoses, obviously. Now, patients like this often have normal hearing, and if they've got normal hearing, we can be relatively confident that the tympanic membrane and middle ear are completely unaffected. If, on the other hand, they have conductive hearing loss, then it is likely, once again, that we're going to look for imaging to tell us what's going on medial to the exostoses. It might be that a conductive hearing loss is just the exostoses and wax and squamous uh, debris and so on blocking sound from reaching the tympanic membrane, but it might be that they have also have a tympanic membrane pathology. This is the kind of classic thing that we uh, uh, this is really probably in children uh, the classic and most common pathology that we really think about the role of otoscopy and the role of imaging. This is a retraction of the tympanic membrane. You can see this patient has a mild retraction of the postero superior part of their tympanic membrane, meaning that not only can you see the hand of the malleus, you can also see the long process of the incus and probably the head of the stapes. <clears throat> In that posterior superior quadrant you see in the top right of the eardrum. Now imaging has a significant role in the assessment of retraction particularly when you can't see the depth of the retraction. Here the whole retraction pocket is visible so we can see that there's no gathering keratin which would indicate that the retraction is becoming a cholesteatoma. Here also, our view of the long process of the incus and stapes gives us a much more subtle representation of uh, any acicular erosion than even very high resolution CT such as flat panel cone beam CT can give. So for a patient like this, you probably don't need to perform any imaging. Your diagnosis is sure. If you're going to perform surgery, it's going to be permeatal surgery. You're not going to involve the mastoid at all. There isn't really any meaningful likelihood of the patient having, you know, disease in the mastoid as well as this, because when cholestatomas arise, they arise from the eardrum, and we can see all of the eardrum in this case. This case is potentially slightly different. Uh, we can see there's probably some middle ear fluid based on the colour of the eardrum. The retraction is a little bit more pronounced, but more importantly, the morphology of the ear canal means that our view of the posterior aspect of the retraction is a little bit more limited, and it's possible that there's a focal pocket developing cholesteatoma either in the pars placida or just immediately posterior to the incus. 
So a case like this would be much more likely to uh, request imaging looking for cholesteatoma, and that would be C2. This patient has the only type of <coughs> uh, cholesteatoma where the tympanic membrane may be intact, and that's a, a, a cholesteatoma that's implanted either congenitally, so a congenital implantation, a congenital uh, cholesteatoma, or iatrogenically, uh, classically with grommet insertion, but equally after tympanoplasty and, and so on. You can see the cholesteatoma arising in the postros inferior part of the medial ear canal. You can see that the patient's probably had some kind of a cartilage graft because the eardrum itself looks very opaque and uh, pale which would be key in keeping with the cartilage graft. And you can have findings like this when the flap is not put back correctly after tympanoplasty surgery. In this case though, depending on the nature of the primary surgery, you may well request imaging because you want to see how far this cholesteatoma extends. But that's essentially what an implanted cholesteatoma looks like down the near canal. When you've got really severe attraction, you're also more likely to request imaging. In this case, Obviously, we can see a severe retraction, which has completely eroded all of the ossicles, except for a little bit of the malleus left. And we've really got a, a very beautiful view of the middle ear. We can see the oval window niche, uh, which uh, um, has the stapes essentially completely eroded. There's potentially a little bit of the posterior crura of the stapes there on the kind of right hand side of the oval window. Uh, you can see the round window niche. Uh, you can see uh, uh, towards the eustachian tube orifice and you've got a beautiful view there of the facial nerve running across the superior part of the ear canal as it takes its horizontal portions. What you don't see completely is the limits of the retraction superiorly and it's possible that the limits of the retraction superiorly are gathering keratin and forming cholesteatoma and that's why imaging might play a role to be sure of the diagnosis. You don't need imaging in this case to show you acicular erosion, uh, obviously, because you can assess the acicular erosion much more accurately just with otoscopy. Uh, cases like this are also uh, typical for uh, wanting to arrange imaging. Uh, the tympanic membrane has got a perforation, but it's not just a perforation. You can see the anterior part of the tympanic membrane there is intact, but the posterior part, this time on the left, uh, is absent and within the middle ear you've got a lump of inflammatory granulation tissue with a little bit of keratin around the edge. You'd be very concerned about the possibility of a cholesteatoma. Uh, you would want to see how much acicular erosion that there has been. And you can see just looking at the back, uh, the posterior part of the annulus, you can see the eardrum itself is not circular. It's almost like a chunk has been taken out of that posterior aspect, which would certainly raise your index of suspicion further. Uh, in cases like this, uh, this is a, a tympanosclerosis or quite advanced tympanosclerosis. Um, uh, broadly speaking, uh, 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 imaging would only really be required to plan surgery. The diagnosis is clear. If there's a conductive hearing loss, the reason for that is also very clear. You've got a lot of new bone formation in and around the middle part of the ear. And that's almost certainly causing fixation. Uh, surgery for tympanosclerosis is frequently unrewarding, but if you are going to perform it, you're going to want to know particular, particularly the status of the stapes and whether there is uh, bone formation and fixation of the stapes itself, uh, of which obviously imaging can give you a good idea, although it is not definitive. And that kind of brings me on to some final points to note, which is that uh, Otoscopy obviously is limited in terms of how deep in the ear it can show you and how much of the function of the ear it can show you. Imaging isn't limited in terms of the depth. And in fact, the, um, uh, the uh, increasingly high resolution, particularly CT imaging, gives us a really good idea of a secular uh, status and shows us beautiful pictures of the ear. But there is still a role for exploratory tympanotomy. Uh, cases like this, where you can see uh, the incus, which would appear essentially relatively normal uh, on cross-sectional imaging, is essentially adhesed to the uh, facial nerve, making uh, 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 being associated essentially with congenital stapes fixation, but congenital stapes fixation, which is not going to be amenable to conventional stapes surgery because you don't have a mobile incus in a 
in a position where you can attach a piston between that and the oval window. Or cases like this. Yeah, this is, um, uh, this is, uh, um, gives you an idea of the kind of view which you can get of exploratory uh, uh, tympanotomy. And this is an exploratory tympanotomy looking for perilymph fistula. The patient is having unusual balance symptoms thought to be secondary to uh, leaking of fluid from the inner ear. And this examination essentially is to look uh, with a patient straining, um, oh, uh, look with a patient straining uh, uh, to see whether we can see fluid leaking out of the uh, RAM window here. Uh, in this case, you can't see that. Uh, just, you know, if you look at the uh, view that you get even of the vasculature over the promontory, you can see what a beautiful view uh, of the tympanotomy can give you as a middle ear. Now, my last point to note, um, and really the kind of area of controversy which I'd like to talk about, um, is diffusion weighted MRI and cholesteatoma diagnosis. Um, so it's not infrequent. Uh, uh, so for patients with hearing loss and ear infections and so on, all of these patients we're talking about before, uh, you know, cases like. Uh, cases like this, when we're suspicious of cholesteatoma, but we don't have sufficient on otoscopic findings to say it definitively, we're going to arrange imaging, and our first line imaging is going to be CT. And the reason we're going to arrange CT rather than MRI is because if we're going to operate on the ear, by far and away the most important things to see are um, erosion of the uh, erosion into the inner ear erosion into the tegmen and erosion of the ossicles. And these things are going to be viewed much more effectively with, um, with CT. Now, there is an argument to say that, you know, something like this could be a, just a severe retraction. And as you can see from uh, cases like this, retraction can certainly cause a secular erosion, even when you don't have cholesteatoma. So this retraction, obviously you can see has eroded uh, the scutum, has eroded the ossicles, um, which were obviously the most common sites of erosion uh, from cholesteatoma. And that's true, but if you have a patient in, uh, in this kind of situation who's getting infection and hearing loss associated with retraction, then you're likely to operate on them anyway. Uh, 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 Broadly speaking, because we think uh, retractions that are getting the currently infected are more likely to become cholestotomatous, and also the infections and the hearing loss in themselves are things that uh, patients often want to have addressed. So diffusion-weighted MRI really has a limited role in diagnosis because cholestotoma is going to um, uh, tell you, it's going, uh, or because cholestotoma is very likely to be identifiable through classic findings like widening of the additus or erosion of the ossicles or erosion of the scutum and so on, uh, they're very likely to be identified on CT. Now, <clears throat> it is true that there are a number of papers, such as this one published in Clinical Radiology um, 18 months ago, saying that uh, diffusion-weighted MRI is actually very good at diagnosing cholestotoma. Now, uh, being controversial, I'm going to say that this is this paper is disingenuous, and the reason I say that is the majority of um, uh, papers are um, uh, of this nature are done by people who want to say can uh, can MRI diagnose cholestatoma, and the way that they do this is by finding a group of patients who are going to have surgery for cholestatoma and a group of patients who are going to have surgery for something that isn't cholestatoma, for example, a perforation, and MRI all of them and use that to determine how accurate uh, MRI is at identifying cholestatoma. And that is, from a kind of purist's point of view, a very, very good way of showing the accuracy in, of MRI in detecting cholestatoma. However, Broadly speaking, kind of going back to the cholestatoma we saw earlier on, but going back to, you know, an ear like this, where you can see a ball of keratin quite clearly there in the 
superior uh, in the path faster in the top of the canal. Uh, uh, I'll just play it again so you can see kind of the ball of cholesterol just at the top, that kind of ball of white that you see there. In someone like this, you don't you don't have any question of whether or not there is cholesterol there. You can see the cholesterol, you can diagnose it clearly. So an MRI to tell you whether or not you have cholesterol is not advancing the situation any further. The situation where you want to know whether or not there's cholesterol is something is uh, is. Uh, the, uh, the situation like this. Now, the difference between this ear and the ear we looked at before is probably to some extent the volume of cholesterol that you might have. So in this ear, you might have a much smaller volume of cholesterol, meaning the diagnosis, sorry, Mr. Hewitt is joining us briefly, meaning the diagnosis on an imaging basis is much less clear. Now, the example, so uh, this was uh, the series that uh, we reported of it some years ago now, and this was uh, uh, an example of what I'm talking about. So this is a patient who, uh, I, I've never met the patient, but they presented and saw uh, an ENT surgeon who noted that they had recurrent infections and hearing loss, and a CT was requested. And you can see the CT findings on the left. You can see there's erosion of the ossicles, erosion of the sputum, and some non-dependent soft tissue uh, in the posterior part of the, or posterior superior part of the mesotympanum. And that is a CT finding essentially of an early, early cholesterol. Um, and you might ask me, how, why is that not retraction? It doesn't go into the mastoid. Um, the reason it's not retraction, obviously, is with retraction, you wouldn't have that thickening of the eardrum. You wouldn't have that thickened uh, collection of non-dependent soft tissue you just have a very very thin eardrum as you can see from the pictures previously you tend to get very atelectatic thin tympanic membranes so th so the ct showed cholesterol but uh the clinician decided to send them for a diffusion weighted mri which was clear and the re and that uh, that's shown in the middle picture and the reason the diffusion weighted mri was clear is because uh diffusion weighted mri needs two to three millimeter wide disease. And whilst this is two to three millimeters long, it's not two to three millimeters wide. And on the basis of an MRI, which did not show cholesterol, this patient then did not have surgery and waited another year to have a further MRI scan, which showed uh, uh, cholesterol because by then the cholesterol was big enough. So this patient had their definitive management delayed by a year on the basis of an MRI um, uh, 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 being recommended for the, the diagnosis of cholesterol by the uh, surgeon who saw them when actually the CT had already uh, uh, really resolved any diagnostic conundrum that you might have. So um, with papers like this, it's not true to say that the group in whom you want an MRI to help the diagnosis is the same as every group as every patient going through uh, uh, to glastatoma, uh, uh, getting surgery for glastatoma. And, and kind of the analogy of that might be, for example, patients with a neck lump. If a patient comes into a room with a, a growth in their neck that is so big that you can see it from the edge of, uh, from the, you know, from the other side of the room, then the diagnostic sensitivity of palpation, of clinical examination in detecting that lump is going to be very, very high. If a patient comes in with a neck lump, which they can only feel sometimes when they turn their head this way or that way, um, then the diagnostic sensitivity of that's going to be much lower. So it's not true to say that in patients that, uh, that in patients where you're uncertain of the diagnosis, that the diagnostic sensitivity of diffusion weight MRI is going to be the same as in patients who you are certain of the diagnosis. And so for that reason, you have to be very careful um, in uh, recommending diffusion weight MRI, particularly in patients with retraction. Uh, if it's in patients who have got uh, uh, 
who fail otoscopy basically because they've got a polyp in the ear canal, it's actually probably quite effective in those cases because those cases are probably much more similar to standard cases as it were. But in retraction, in my experience or in our experience, certainly it's much less good. Now, that does go a little bit against some published evidence. So uh, the, this, um, these figures, for example, are taken from Alvo's paper in which Alvo said that uh, or, or classified high risk retraction pockets and said that, that diffusion weighted MRI was actually very successful. But the interesting thing about Alvo's paper and indeed this paper is they're both papers about imaging for diagnosis of cholesteatoma and neither paper really mentions CT at all. This paper, for example, the word CT do not appear at all. Um, and considering diagnosis of cholestetoma without talking about CT is obviously not really in keeping with general, uh, you know, with standard ecological practice really across the world. Alvo's paper mentioned CT, but really only in passing and not generally as a separate group. And, you know, the CT that they do mention is uh, given in these figures. So this is a, a figures which they published showing a time in which C, uh, um, in which uh, 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 DWMRI has managed to detect a cholestetoma that otherwise wouldn't be detectable. But it, what I would ask you to do is to look at these figures, which are obviously the ones published in this paper, and wonder somewhat um, why with otoscopy, and I've obviously shown you kind of the kind of views that you can get with otoscopy and the parts of the ear that you can see, why cholestetoma that's present as it is here, you know, occupying essentially half of the top part of the tympanic membrane uh, with non-dependent soft tissue is not visible on otoscopy. So I, what, my, my, what my position would be would be that I think it's highly likely that cholestetoma would be visible in this the example case that they give, which is why I have some reservations about the uh, quoted accuracy of a diffusion weight MRI in the proverbial high risk uh, uh, retraction pocket described in the Alvo paper in uh, I think 2015, 2016, something like that. At any rate, that's the uh, area of controversy at the end. So we've talked a little bit about, or we've talked and shown a little bit about what otoscopy can assess in the middle ear and why that's important for imaging and what we need imaging then to show us. And we've talked about that in otologic pathologies and particularly in its relation to the diagnosis of cholestetoma. Are there any questions? Hello, I'm back again. And thank you very much for this lecture. Really interesting. Um, there are uh, several questions. Uh, I would like to start with one controversial question as well. And it, it, it is about CT and it's about some mistakes I've done in the interpretation. When we read the, the, the published evidence, we say like, if there is erosion in the scutum, typically the ossicles, we think of a cholesteatoma. Most of the inflammation do not give erosion, but there is described entity called uh, non-cholestatomatous uh, erosion that because it's less powerful, this is my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know this conversation is really useful to understand things uh, because it's really less powerful in terms of um, um, erosive potential than cholesteatoma will hit the, the, the most weak part, uh, namely the, the, the stapes and uh, uh, incudostapedial joint. So this is the differential. But I remember at least one case when you, know, you call me back and say, this, is, this was a cholesteatoma on surgery that was eroding only the ossicles without uh, um, the, the massive erosion that we normally expect on CT. So my, my question is, uh, on the other side, how sensitive is the CT when we do not see the typical uh, erosive large mass that, as you showed, most of the time is visible on uh, um, otoscopy, and you just need the CT to, to see how extensive is the soft tissue that we already know being a cholesteatoma. What is the other uh, part of the of the coin, let's say, what do you think is the power of our, um, CT and what are the most common mistakes that we do as radiologists and you find out on surgery? So, uh, 
from my perspective, I think the most common mistake, as I see, is is uh, in patients with retraction talking about diffusion weighted MRI with an implication that it's superior to CT in diagnosis. Um, uh, that and really, I'd say that's the only mistake that I see. Really, I have to say, I don't. Um, I, I'm very fortunate to work with very good radiologists, obviously. But I really don't see other other mistakes. Now, um, I suppose my whole point about diagnosis of cholestatoma and diffusion weighted MRI and CT and so on is exactly as you say. There are some patients who have clinically evident disease. And those, uh, uh, those patients, the diagnosis is clear. We're doing a CT to look for complications and plan surgery. And that's it. And those, that's all those patients are getting. And then we have another group of patients who the diagnosis is not completely clear. And we're going to do imaging to give us more information. It's going to help us a bit with diagnosis. It's going to help us if we do go on to do surgery. It's going to help us look for, for complications. Now, whether or not, or, or uh, when you consider the sensitivity and specificity of CT in that setting, it does make you get a little bit philosophical about exactly what cholesteatoma is. And the reason for that is, um, if I if I share screen uh, and it, if I go back to say, for example, I go back to this condition or this particular patient, you can see that their condition essentially starts with a retraction. Now, by the time they've had the CT, they have thickened tissue there. Um, and that tells me that there will be cholesterol there because that thickened tissue has got to be either granulation or keratin. It's not going to be nothing at all. It's not a clean retraction. So this is, this is not a radiologist's error. The radiologist reported this as in keeping with cholesterol. This is a clinical error to kind of want more certainty, um, to want someone to say, this is definitely cholestatoma, you must do this, instead of kind of looking at the ear as an ear that is having recurrent infection and hearing loss. So that ear, it looked like that then, but it probably looked, you know, a little bit like this, you know, a few months beforehand and so on. It came from retraction. And what's a little bit philosophical is, uh, is when does a retraction become a cholesterol? Because at some stage you're going to have retraction uh, that gets infected and when it's infected it's got a load of keratin in, but then you can suck that out and treat it with eardrops and it might recover and go back to a normal retraction and be absolutely fine. And really a cholesterol in that case is if you've got persistent keratin that is there for three months really, or six weeks, depending on your, uh, uh, or depending on who you listen to. Now in practice, obviously you're never going to see patients in that kind of situation, you know, like the clinically evident cholesterol, you're not going to say, oh, let's see you back in six weeks to make sure that's not a retraction. To some extent you operate on the patient. So if the patient's having recurrent infection and hearing loss, broadly speaking, you're going to do an operation because there are things that you're going to make better. It's only those patients who don't have recurrent infections that you might want more information. And really, um, and really uh, uh, in those patients, it's hard to say kind of what the sensitivity and specificity of CT are. Um, uh, you know, you might have some non-dependent soft tissue in prussic space, you might have, uh, and that might be it, um, uh, you might have um, retraction with a little bit of erosion and a little bit of non-dependent tissue in that, like in that previous case, uh, in the mesotympanum. Um, uh, but ex I suppose the point I'm trying to make, I suppose, is expecting CT on its own to make the diagnosis is perhaps not fair on CT. 
Um, uh, and But that doesn't necessarily mean that more imaging is the answer. CT and diffusion weighted MRI are probably not huge, not not very much better in those cases where you don't have a lot of non-dependent soft tissue or not a lot of accumulating tissue. Um, uh, in cases where you do, uh, fusion probably helps a bit. Um, uh, but really, it's looking at the CT with the clinical findings, the history of infection and uh, hearing loss, and the otoscopic findings. So those three together, um, uh, um, their accuracy for determining cholesterol really is quite high. And even if in those cases that you operate on that don't have cholesterol, often you've got a recurrently infected retraction pocket, which is probably the right thing to operate on anyway. Thank you very much. I have other five questions. Do you have time for them? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so just as a, as a comment on that, uh, the spatial resolution on DWI, we all know that we should use the non-EPI uh, DWI. Yeah. We do have a multi-shot EPI DWI that, according to Sun, is, is very good as well because it reduces the artifact. Uh, so the result, for instance, that increases the... So it's an EPI DWI, but increases the spatial resolution. So this is also possible alternative solution, which are, we are evaluating because, again, there are things published, but you need to yeah, yeah, then, yeah. then check. So I have um, um, one um, question uh, by Dr. Manka, that is how important is, uh, um, in your report, uh, the report you received to distinguish between primary and secondary cholesteatoma? What do you think about that? Um, uh, by primary and secondary cholesteatoma, um, do you mean... Um, um, uh, it's uh, arising from the attic or arising from the meat tympanum. Yeah, or inflammation, I think inflammation or traumatic yeah. derived the secondary, yeah, I think. I, just, uh, I think it is, from that perspective, the diagnosis is less important. Um, uh, so, and the otoscopic findings are really going to tell you that. So uh, to me, that wouldn't be essential. For me, to me, for the essential things for a cholesterol report, the one most important thing is presence or absence of inner ear fistula. Uh, second, secondly, um, erosion of, um, uh, erosion of uh, tegmen and so on. Uh, and I suppose also with that, um, an idea mm -hmm. if present of, or, or a suspicion of extension to the petrous apex, and then a secular erosion, and then uh, findings beyond that. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Uh, I have um, one question that uh, was sent me by message and is what about, because I know you often ask for DWI, especially in post-op. So, yeah, so on, by the way, you mentioned, oh, sorry, you mentioned EPI and non-EPI DWI and evaluating yourself. I think that is really, really, really important. Um, I was talking to uh, some Canadian surgeons uh, who work in Toronto who have a very large otologic practice and they have never managed to get um, accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, you know, more than 60-70% uh, for their diffusion weight MRI and so have now essentially stopped performing it and perform regular second looks. Um, uh, so um, I think, yeah, I think, you know, regardless of the machine you have and the settings you use and so on, I think you have to evaluate your own practice. Yeah, that, that's very, very helpful. This is really important part, actually, from, from this talk. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's very important for us to have your point of view, because otherwise we go at more advanced, more advanced, and we, we lose the touch for, for what uh, we should really give you answers, basically. The answer we can give you, not the one that we cannot. Uh, so uh, even for post-op DWI, you think is second look is the most important thing? Because I noticed that you ask a lot of post-operative to... Yeah, no, no, so so um, the area in which diffusion weight MRI is really, really accepted is post-op. And that's very different from the otoscopic findings. So, uh, uh, for otoscopic findings post-op, you're going to see an intact tympanic membrane, usually with cartilage. Uh, you do cartilage, so you're less likely to have a new cholesterol forming, a new retraction forming. Um, uh, and that basically means you can't see anything in the middle ear, and you can't see anything in the mastoid. So you're looking for residual disease. So otoscopy isn't telling you uh, anything really. Uh, hearing tests aren't really telling you anything about residual cholesterol. Um, uh, so you've really got no information at all. 
Uh, CT, um, CT post-op is uh, dismal, obviously. Um, uh, um, so diffusion-weighted MRI is really, really, really good. It's got, you know, its sensitivity, specific, or its accuracy overall is probably a little bit over 90%. Um, by the time you uh, exclude two millimeter lesions and below, the accuracy, the sensitivity probably goes up to about 96, 97, 98%. Uh, so you're going to be finding the vast majority. So for patients who have had surgery, um, post-op diffusion weight MRI is fantastic. And I, as you know, I request lots and lots and lots of it in that setting. Okay. Um, we have the time for the last question, which is from uh, um, Dr. Juliana in Boston. And she asked, um, basically, uh, let me read properly. Uh, first of all, um, if you think that the, um, uh, the fusion, CT and MRI uh, fusion can help, uh, we are not doing at the moment, but in case just, you know, what's your experience if you have and, uh, you know, if you want me to work on that. And Please. if you do, uh, sorry, and if you do endoscopic resection for cholesterol. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, I do endoscopic uh, where, where appropriate. So endosco what endoscopic is best for is uh, the congenital cholestetomas um, and cholestetoma that is really quite limited. I don't think anyone really does cholestetoma surgery endoscopically when it goes beyond the lateral semicircular canal. So that, um, uh, I think everyone does um, uh, uh, microscopic surgery, even the, I mean, the Italians do lots and lots, but you work in Boston. So I've been to visit uh, Dan, uh, uh, Professor Lee, who does a lot of um, uh, excellent endoscopic work, but once again, he'll only go um, as far as the lateral canal, and when it extends beyond the lateral canal, then he'll do microscopic surgery in the same way that, you know, he'll do microscopic uh, uh, cochlear implant surgery as well. Um, uh, sorry, that was the second second part. Of, what was the first? Oh, the, the, the fusion between... Oh, the fusion, yeah. yeah. So, uh, fuse, I mean... Fusion is fusion's just nice, isn't it? Fusion is really... Um, I mean, I suppose you could kind of say that the future is probably going to be, uh, the future certainly post-op and probably for pre-op imaging for most of these patients is going to be cone beam imaging with fusion diffusion weight MRI uh, because you're going to have, you know, very, very high resolution, low dose CT um, with a good idea of what tissue is squamous and what isn't. And I think realistically, that's going to be the future. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the future is that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not there yet. I don't think anyone is there yet. And, um, uh, and I think in due course, we'll see that, but it does, it does help a bit. I think for, um, the, um, um, for preoperative planning, uh, we did a, a paper, I think, about 2012, um, looking at how um, diffusion weight MRI can uh, guide whether you do front to back or back to front surgery at the time. And these days, that would be diffusion weight MRI predicting whether or not something is endoscopically achievable or whether you have to use microscope. And that's particularly the case when you have a cholestetoma that goes into the antrum, but not any further than the antrum but because it's obstructed the antrum, you get uh, fluid filling up the uh, temporal bone, the mastoid. When you do a CT, obviously, you can't tell whether that fluid is cholestetoma, so you can't tell whether the whole mastoid is full of uh, cholestetoma or whether there's a load of fluid. And diffusion weight MRI, we found then, was very helpful at saying whether you have limited disease. Actually, there are things you can see on CT you know, loss of the trabeculation and so on, which can give you a clue, although diffusion weight MRI is probably a bit better. Um, uh, and yeah, so I think it probably does help you there um, uh, to guide whether or not you can do endoscopic surgery. Okay, thank you. Um, we need to finish. So um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, and um, uh, we will be back uh, on the 26th of March with another clinician. Uh, and um, um, and thank you, Rob, for that. It was amazing. And thank you for all of you guys uh, streaming on YouTube. And see you next time.
Bye.